This is the 13th and final session in a series on an overview of the Bible. We recognize that we could spend 13 sessions studying one chapter or even one verse of the Bible and not exhaust all of the spiritual truths which are there. But we hope, we hope that we are encouraging you to study the Bible, for you will find it to be a lamp under your feet and a light under your path. The Bible teaches that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. When you read the Bible, you will discover a central message of Scripture, that it is encouraging you and commanding you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. The Bible pictures conversion with the imagery of matrimony, so that Jesus as the bridegroom comes to the marriage altar, and he gives everything up for you and for me. He gives to us the sun, the moon, and the stars to enjoy. All the creatures of earth and things of earth, the earth is ours to have dominion over and to possess. But if that was not enough, he gave himself. And the Bible said, he that spared not his own, but delivered his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? That's the way that Jesus Christ comes to the marriage altar. But frequently, when people come down a church aisle in order to, quote, join the church, we have a lot of reservations, and we say, do I have to tithe? Do I have to come to church on Sunday night? Is it necessary to go to prayer meeting? How much of the Bible do I have to read? Now, that would be like some woman coming to the marriage altar and saying to her husband-to-be, oh, I love you very much, but I also love Tom and George and Jim, so I'm going to spend Sundays with you, and I'll spend Mondays with this man and Tuesdays with another man and Wednesdays with another man. You know, that wouldn't be marriage. That would be less than God intended marriage to be. And when you come to God, you must come loving him with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. When you do, you will discover a glorious experience. In our previous session, we talked about the word glory. It literally means heavy, something which is weighty or profound, something which you cannot explain adequately in words. And when you become one with Jesus Christ in the glorious matrimony of the new covenant, a miracle happens. All of your past sins are forgiven and forgotten by God. Your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. God personally comes to dwell in your heart. Your heart becomes the ark of the new covenant, and your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God. And in this relationship, I believe there is a nonverbal communication which you experience. Husbands and wives who have been married for many years come to the place where with a simple gesture or a glance of the eyes they can communicate volumes because they have been intimate for so long. The Bible makes reference to this in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, verses 19 and 20, Ref making reference to the intimacy of knowing God personally. The writer of Hebrews said, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus. Now, the Hebrew people were afraid to enter into the holiest of all. The only one of the Hebrew nation who could do that was the high priest. He only on one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, after he had been properly clothed and sanctified, then and only then could he enter into the holiest of all. Christians, however, have boldness to enter in all the time into the very presence of God. But we enter by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now, we're talking about Jesus, of course. The word veil occurs the first time in the book of Genesis in the 24th chapter. Isaac was to have a wife. She had come all the way from Paden Aram. Rebekah was her name. She had never met her husband-to-be, and as she gazed across the field, she saw a man asked the servant of Abram who it was, and he said, that's going to be your husband, that's Isaac. And the Bible says she put on a veil. She didn't want Isaac to see her with the dust of the journey upon her face. 
The next time the word veil is used is in the 38th chapter of the book of Genesis. This time it is used with reference to Tamar, who covered herself with a veil in order that she might seduce her unsuspecting father-in-law. And Judah fathered twins by her, never knowing who it was because she was wearing a veil. The next time the word veil is used is in the book of Exodus, where we read that a veil separated the holy place of the tabernacle from the holy of holies. Of course, the purpose of a veil was to keep people from seeing beyond the veil. The Bible says, in some respect, the flesh of Jesus Christ was a veil. The spiritual implications of this are quite profound. I had always thought that the flesh of Jesus Christ revealed God, not veiled or concealed God. The first chapter of the Gospel of John says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The word declared in the Greek language is exegesita, from which we get our English word exegesis. Jesus is the exegesis of God, but not the flesh of Jesus. God's a spirit. The flesh of Jesus did not really reveal the nature of God. Don't you remember in the upper room, Philip said, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, Have I been so long time with you, and you've not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Now Philip, Jesus, Philip knew Jesus in the flesh. He could recognize him in a crowd of 5,000 men, and did so but he really didn't discern the nature of Jesus. And I'm suggesting that it's possible for you to memorize the four Gospels and to know every earthly fact about the physical life of Jesus Christ and still not know him. The most ranting atheist on earth could pass a Gospels class in the average Christian college. Because when we talk about the life of Christ, we normally speak about 33 years of flesh. But the book of Hebrews says that's like a veil. The flesh of Jesus, we enter in beyond the veil to the holiest of all. The flesh of Jesus was like a veil. Jesus was omniscient, omnipresent. He was in existence before the foundation of the world, before Abraham was. I am, he said, and he will always be in existence when the earth has melted into dust and the heavens have been rolled together as a scroll. And I think it's possible for you not only to study the Bible and to know the will of God, but I think it's possible for God to communicate with you in a way non-verbally. Alexander Campbell had an experience like that. It's found in this book about Alexander Campbell by Robert Richardson, Memoirs of Alexander Campbell. His father had come to America, and he and the family were following the next year. It was the year 1808. It was October the 7th. It was late in the evening, and as they were wa uh, waiting for favorable winds to sail from Glasgow, Scotland, Alexander was reading to his sister. After having attended the family worship and scripture recitation as usual, he had reclined upon one of the sofas and was reading aloud to his sister Dorothea in Boston's fourfold state. Finding after some time that she was becoming drowsy, he ceased reading and soon afterward himself fell into somewhat of an uneasy slumber. At length, he started up with evident marks of alarm and told his mother and sisters that he was confident uh, that a great danger was impending. Now, what happened was this. Alexander Campbell dreamed that the ship they were in was going to experience a shipwreck, that it was going to be blown upon a rock, that the uh, water would be coming in around all the baggage in the bottom of the ship, and uh, he didn't know whether they were going to live or die, and so he told his family, I'm not taking off my clothes this evening, and I recommend that you do not take yours off either. Alexander's strange premonition came true. That very night, just as he had dreamed, the ship was blown on a rock. The bottom of the ship was broken up. The baggage was covered with water. They began to fire minute guns, trying to awaken people on the shore to let them know of their distress. That was to no avail because the wind was blowing so loudly. Uh, the ship was about to capsize. They took broadswords in the middle of the night and hewed down the masts that the ship might have a better chance to stay aright. And there, in a howling storm in the middle of the night, Alexander Campbell sat down on the mast 
uh, of the ship that had been chopped down and dedicated his life to the ministry. Now, he didn't read that in the book of Acts. He didn't find that particular bit of information in the book of Romans. But he intuitively knew something beyond the veil. He had a personal experience with God. Roy Weiss is a friend of mine whom I've had respect for for many, many years, and every morning he gets up and prays for God's guidance. Now, the book of James teaches that if you ask in faith, nothing doubting, God will give you wisdom. Now, if you don't believe you're going to get any wisdom, you won't. Let not that man uh, think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Well, one morning, uh, Roy prayed as usual, and he was out calling. And he saw a home, and he told me this story personally, and then repeated it over the 30,000-watt voice of the Ozark Christian College. And he said, I saw this house and remembered a promise that I had made that I would make a call on this particular man. So impulsively, I just turned down his lane, realizing after I had done so that they also told me he worked in the daytime and would probably, I'd probably have to catch him in the evening. But since I had committed myself to make the call, I, well, I'm this far, I'll go on up and see if he's home. Knocked on the door. Sure enough, the man was there. He said, uh, may I help you? And Roy said, I'm Roy Weiss with a church on 9th Street in Eldon, Missouri. And some of your neighbors thought that maybe I should stop by and talk to you about the Lord. The man said, Mr. Weiss, come in. I want to show you something. He took him to the corner, showed him a chair, and said, five minutes ago, I was sitting in this chair. Then he produced a revolver and said, I had this gun at my temple. I was going to take my life. And then I thought, just maybe there's a God. And if there is, I'd better try and talk to him. So I got down on my knees and I prayed. And I prayed that, God, if you're there and if you're listening, you better send somebody to help me because if you don't, I'm going to blow my brains out. It was at that point in time Roy Weiss just felt that he needed to make that call. If human beings can communicate non-verbally is it not also possible that our infinite creator God can communicate to those of you who have intimate experiences with him? About 10 miles to the east of this place where we're filming right now is a company called the General Irrigation Company. It's located in Carthage, Missouri. The owner of that company is a personal friend of mine and has been so for many, many years. His name is Richard Diggs. In 19... 75, Richard Diggs applied for 117 patents. He had prayed about this and felt like he had a gift of God and uh, wondered if he could do better than Thomas Alva Edison. As I recall, Thomas Edison in his biggest year applied for 85 patents. Richard Diggs, with only a high school diploma, applied for 117 patents in one year. He was credited with the invention of the year and also was credited as being the inventor of the year by a group of international scientists. The invention of the year in 1975 was liquid electricity, and Richard Diggs has patented a process by which electricity can be reduced to a liquid. Now, he's quick to admit he doesn't have that much intelligence. He doesn't claim to. He believes that he has a gift from God. He believes that God communicates to him. Now, he doesn't hear voices like you hear my voice, but it's something intuitive. There's another scientist who lived not far from here, George Washington Carver. Of course, Dr. Carver has been dead now for many years. But uh, he went to Neosho, Missouri as a small slave boy, only 14 years of age, the only school in this area that would take black children. And a lady named Mariah Watkins took care of him down there. She gave him a Bible, taught him about the Lord Jesus Christ, and told him that he needed to turn himself over to the Lord and then take the knowledge he would get and share it with his people. Dr. Carver did just that. For the last 40 years of his life, he lived on $125 a month at the Tuskegee Institute. Thomas, Ed Thomas Edison offered him a base salary of $100,000 a year if he would come and work with him. Dr. Carver declined to do that. 
He was the man, the first man in history, to produce synthetics. He said there have always been three kingdoms, animal, vegetable, and mineral. But he believes that God helped him to penetrate and understand the world of synthetics, and it happened with the peanut. He said, I prayed, Mr. Creator, why did you make the peanut? And then he went into his laboratory and stayed there for two days and nights without coming out. And when he did come out, the peanut was not just a peanut, but it was the basis for 300 synthesized products, including charcoal briquettes and vanishing cream and dyes and shoe polish and cornflakes and coffee and etc. 300 products. When Dr. Carver explained this to a congressional committee, kind of a humorous thing happened on his way to the, to the White House. He got off the train in Washington, D.C., and with his ragged, tattered clothing and two beaten suitcases, uh, he asked a man directions to the White House. The man said, don't bother me. I'm trying to find George Washington Carver. Well, when Dr. Carver arrived at the White House, it was late in the day, and the con congressmen were tired, and they said, we'll give you 10 minutes. So he went to the front, he began opening these suitcases and pulling out some of these products which had all been produced from the peanut. And instead of staying there 10 minutes, he kept them several hours. Because, and they said, where'd you learn this? He said, I got it from a book. They said, what book? George Washington Garver said, the Bible. He believed somehow that God intuitively guided him and helped him. Also about 10 miles from here, is a man by the name of Sam Butcher. Some of you will recognize the name Sam Butcher because he, associated, he is associated with precious moments figurines. Sam Butcher became a multimillionaire in three years' time. He and his family were in abject poverty. I got to interview his wife one time on the radio. She said there was a time when we had five children, didn't have anything to eat. We didn't have an automobile. They sat down at the table and prayed. Nothing on the table to eat. We got up and left, took a walk, and when we came back, would you believe it, she said, there was food on the table. A neighbor of ours had, was in the process of moving, and they had some perishable goods in their refrigerator. They didn't want to just go to waste. They brought them to us, and since we were not there and the door was open, they brought those things in and left them on the table. The way that Sam and Katie Butcher moved to this area was written up in this issue of the Joplin Globe. There is one of Sam Butcher's uh, characters in this particular newspaper. Well, at any rate, they lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he was at an artist's convention in uh, Southern California. And he began traveling across country. And each time he would stop for the night, he would call his wife. She had a large map of the United States on the wall of their home. And they would pray over the telephone, wondering where God was guiding them. When at last they came to Joplin, Missouri, Sam Butcher said, Katie, I believe this is the place that God is, is guiding us to. And so he went to a realtor, and he took with him his sketch pad. And uh, he began doodling, and he said, I want to buy a house that looks like this. There's another house down here, and there's a creek flowing by. And of course, the realtor thought he was crazy because Sam had never been in this area. He had never seen that house before, but it was in his mind, and intuitively, he believed God was guiding him. Well, he went to another realtor, and the man said, oh, yes, I know where that house is. It's just south of Carthage, Missouri. So he went over, and there was the house, exactly like Sam had sketched it. There was another house down below, and then there was a creek flowing by. That is the location, according to this issue of the Joplin Globe, where a tremendous chapel is being uh, constructed and it will be for precious moments characters. And uh, it's just in the process of being constructed at this time. Is it possible, is it remotely possible that the God who communicated with his word to the peoples of earth can also to believers communicate in a way so intimate that he doesn't need words to communicate I've got a book here by Peter Wagner called On the Crest of the Wave. This particular book uh, teaches that there are 78,000 more Christians every day and that 
One of the reasons why we are cresting on a wave of worldwide evangelism is that God is today moving in unusual and supernatural ways. Mr. Wagner teaches at the Fuller School of World Missions in Southern California. He confesses that as a missionary for 16 years in Bolivia, he had never seen a sign or a wonder, never had a miraculous answer to prayer. But he began to hear more and more stories about answers to prayer and came to believe that they are in fact occurring and that one of the reasons why we deny this is because that we here in the Western world have been bombarded, have been bombarded by humanism to the extent that we refuse to believe anything that we cannot explain. That's the same reason why a lot of people don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. They can't explain it, therefore they don't believe in it. Well, at any rate, he tells a number of unusual stories in this particular book. One is about a church in Central America, Santa Rosa, Guatemala. The congregation was called Principe de Paz, which means Prince of Peace. It had a remarkable growth. A little bitty community of the church grew to over 1,000. The reason it grew, he says, is that they prayed for wisdom during a drought. There wasn't any water in the area. They prayed for wisdom, and God directed them, they felt, to dig on top of a hill for water. They went up on top of the hill behind the pastor's house, of all things, and began to dig. The community laughed and scoffed until they hit water, and the only water in the village was there. And a deacon stood by the well and said, whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give shall never thirst. But the water that Jesus gives will be within you a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He also tells of the Mankani Yesuth Lutheran, Lutheran Church in Ethiopia which is one of the fastest growing congregations in the world. In two years' time, it grew from 100,000 to 500,000 members. He goes on to explain that the reason why the church has had such dramatic growth is not that all of a sudden these Ethiopians are becoming theological and understanding some technical doctrine espoused by Martin Luther. It's the fact that they're seeing answers to prayer. Oh, I want you to read the Bible. I want you to believe in the Bible. But more than that, I want you to believe that God lives today. Here's a book called Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. Uh, Don Richardson has written Peace Child and Lords of the Earth, and this is another fantastic book, and it talks about the power of God at work on the mission field. It's been my privilege to know missionaries to Asia that are associated with Eugene and Robert Morris, and I asked them if this was so, that there are people over there who are Peoples of the Lost Book. He has a whole chapter in here called Peoples of the Lost Book, the Lisu tribe, for example. And uh, we've been playing a cassette of the Lisu language. These people have a tradition that has been in their tribe for generations that God gave them his word, but they lost it. But the white man didn't lose the word of God, and so these peoples from the mountains of Asia have been waiting on the white man to come with the word of God. Well, Don Richardson tells about the Wa tribe and a very unusual incident. There was a medicine man or a soothsayer in one of these tribes who got a revelation or vision that the white man with a book from God was in their area. He saddled a pony and told some of his servants to follow that pony and it would lead them to this man with a book from God. According to page 102 in this book, they followed the pony for 200 miles over mountainous terrain. Now I'm quoting. The pony stopped beside a well. Puchan's disciples looked in all directions but could see no trace of either a white brother or a book. Nelda Widland, the daughter of Vincent Young and granddaughter of Marcus, or William Marcus Young, told me in person what happened next, for she was raised on that very mission compound and drank often from that well. The details which follow form a treasured memory of the entire Young clan. The Wa tribesmen heard sounds in the well. They looked inside it and saw no water, but only two clear blue eyes looking up at them out of a friendly bearded white face. Hello, strangers, the voice speaking in the Shan language echoed from the well. May I help you? William Marcus Young climbed out of the well, which was not yet in use. He was just in the process of digging it. As he brushed the dust from his hands and faced them, the Wa messengers asked, Have you brought a book from God? 
Young nodded. The Wa men, overcome with emotion, fell at his feet and blurted out the message from Puchan. They had added, This pony is saddled especially for you. Our people are all waiting. Fetch the book. We must be on our way. Let me take this final opportunity to appeal to you to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let him that is a thirst say, Come. Whosoever will can come. It doesn't matter what kind of educational background or social background you have. God loves you individually and personally. There's a warning, however, that I want to remind you of that's found in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts in verse 40. Paul, after preaching a wonderful sermon on grace, after inviting people to find the remission of sins, said, Beware, lest that come upon you which was spoken of in the prophets. And then he quoted Habakkuk 1.5, Behold, you despisers, and wonder and perish, for I will work a work in your days, a work which you will in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. The thing which happened in the days of Habakkuk was that the Chaldeans came like predators pouncing upon a prey and tore apart the nation of Israel. Paul warned the people in Antioch the same thing would happen to them. You can't just approach the Bible like someone window shopping, saying, well, I can take it or leave it. We have an eternal and all-powerful God who will be praised. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We appeal to you, confess him now while it will mean your salvation, rather than waiting until the judgment when it will mean damnation. May God bless you is my prayer.